This is Tim. And this is Ryan. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo. In this episode, we're looking at an ambitious new comic that's nearly 250 pages long, and it's all about talking about science. Wait, 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 hear me out. There's more in this episode for the science challenge than you might imagine, and a fair amount of it applies to how society thinks about comics and problems faced by any creator of comics or anything else with a work that isn't in a firmly established category. There are two parts to this episode. First, everyone's favorite double threat geek, specializing in both science and comics criticism, Ryan Haupt, returns to Deconstructing Comics after a long hiatus to help me review the book, called simply The Dialogues. What's this book trying to be? Does it succeed? Also, Ryan tells us about the best nonfiction science comics he's read. Then, I talk to the author of the dialogues, Clifford V. Johnson, a professor of physics at the University of Southern California and science advisor to Hollywood, including the movie Thor Ragnarok. He explains why this project took close to two decades to come to fruition, the hurdles he ran into in finishing the book and finding a publisher, what not to say when pitching your book to a publisher, and why he loves the Apple Pencil. First, don't forget that your pledge via Patreon helps keep the show going. Check out our goals and rewards and make your pledge at patreon.com slash deconcomics. If you're not prepared to make a commitment, but you'd like to throw something in the tip jar, you can also make a one-time donation of any amount through PayPal. Send it to donate at deconstructingcomics.com. We appreciate your support. Okay, I'm talking with Ryan Haupt, who hasn't been on the show in four years. I don't know, I'm kind of going through a period here where I'm bringing back people who haven't been on the show in a long time. But, uh, yeah, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I was excited to be asked back on. Yeah, well, I was looking back. So, back in 2013, we recorded four episodes. The last one came out in at the beginning of 2014, where... You and uh, James Robinson and I talked about Starman, but uh, yeah, just um, for various reasons, just we haven't gotten back together again. While we were saying before we started recording, you were you had uh, moved and gotten married in that time, so that's part of it. But and was honestly, I was in a bit of a comics slump. I hadn't been reading that many comics, and only recently, in the past couple of months, have I really kind of tried to get back in the habit of reading comics regularly again so good timing right well and um for people who don't know who you are so um you you uh i know you were sort and now are again kind of a contributor to ifanboy and then you also have your own podcast so tell us about that uh well i work with the ifanboy guys so i was a writer for them back when their website had written content and ron richards one of the co-founders now has a job with Marvel, and that precludes him from being on a comics uh, critique review podcast. And so the guys asked me to uh, step up for the occasional guest spot. So I've been doing that, which is a big part of the reason that I've been reading as many comics as I have been. And it's been a lot of fun uh, to get to talk about comics and get to talk about craft and all that stuff. But I also am a failed physicist, which will be relevant to... <laughs> This book we're about to talk about, and uh, in my physics failure, I found paleontology, and I'm now a paleontologist finishing up my PhD at the University of Wyoming, and I do the science podcast called Science Sort of, where uh, we try to recreate the dialogues that scientists have with one another. Yeah. With beer. And uh, I've generally inv invited you on to talk about comics that have something to do with science. We talked about Razzle, we talked about Chew, uh, Manhattan Projects. Um, so now th in this case, we have a comic that's very, very related to science. Um, this was something that, uh, somebody at MIT press, uh, sent me, um, it's called the dialogues conversations about the nature of the universe by Clifford V. Johnson. 
And uh, from what scientists MIT... love, we love using our middle initial. That's <laughs> such a. I'm not joking. That's such a scientist thing. I use my middle initial when I publish in science too. Interesting. Because there's because there are. I think there is another Ryan Haupt out there who is a researcher. And so if you know you were searching for publications, mm. you might think that I did something totally different. Uh, so I have to use my middle initial to okay, distinguish so myself. There's, from there's all a, pra- the other Ryan a, a practical reason for it. It's not just a kind of snootiness or something. I mean. It can be both. Both. <laughs> I said not just that. Okay. Oh, okay. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. You were clear. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so Johnson uh, is a professor of physics at University of Southern California. Um, and from what MIT Press told me, uh, he gives a lot of public lectures, and he's been a science advisor for some movies and TV shows, including uh, Marvel's Thor Ragnarok. And uh, the National Geographic Channel's genius. I don't know what that is, but yeah, I'm guessing he's working with the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a group, or it's a, a yeah, I guess a group uh, organized by the National Academy of Sciences. That their sole purpose is to get scientists in touch with creative people, uh, especially Hollywood. And I know the, a lot of the Marvel movies all have. Uh, science advisors provided by this organization. So I actually know some of the folks in there, and I'm I'm on their roster. So any day now, I could get called up. Marvel, I'm waiting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe they'll call after they hear this episode. That's ex- that's the tipping point. I, I agree. <laughs> the immen- immense power that we wield on this podcast. Anyway. And with great responsibility, no less. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and now there's no explicit artist credit on this book, so I assume that Johnson must have drawn it, too, because there's no other name there. So it just says that he is the author, so maybe he did everything. Yeah, that stands to reason. Um, okay, so we need to talk about this both as a book about science and as a comic, but first let's kind of explain what it is. Uh, there are, there, so each kind of chapter is a conversation about science and particularly physics um, presented in comics form, and it's basically just two people talking. Um, although, you know, since it is comics, he's able to, you know, demonstrate things graphically uh, when necessary. Well, and he said the inspiration for it in the in the forward of the book, he talks about the inspiration a little bit, and it's that the um, format of a dialogue is actually an oft-used format in uh, the explanation of science. So um, some of the oldest works about science are written in the form of a dialogue. Uh, I think the most famous one is Galileo's um, which would he write? Uh, dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. So that's the one that got him in trouble with the church because he essentially had a character that was uh, not so subtly supposed to be the Pope, and that character was the dummy. <laughs> and if you know about history in Galileo, he ended up getting in some trouble with yeah. the uh, with the Pope. So, mm. and they, actually, uh, Galileo and that Pope were friends before that guy became Pope. They actually were buddies. Oh wow! I, th- I, don't, I don't think I'll, as many people know that, but no. Um, and I actually have read some of the Galileo's dialogue, the Chief World Concerning Two Systems, or whatever. The translation from Italian, obviously, and it's it's pretty good. <laughs> so mm. uh, it can be a really fun format to write in if you're skilled at it. Um, and also, a lot of the science writing I've read from a certain time. So like some of the Freud stuff, Freud would actually write and Darwin did this too. They would think about what a potential criticism of their um, work would be. Uh, if you see people say, well, Darwin didn't have an explanation for X, Y, or Z. The reason that he didn't have an explanation, but still wrote about it is because he was writing it from a, well, what if a person were to say this about my theory of evolution? And so he would try to present both argument and counter argument in the same volume, hmm. which is kind of cool. So, hmm. okay. So in, in this book, so yeah, in, in that preface, which is, pretty wordy it's it you know there are these huge paragraphs and it fills a few pages um but uh he talks about his sort of goal in making this book um and sort of the key 
point here I put into my notes. Um, it's a little bit long. When scientists are trying to understand each other's work or uncover some new truth about how nature works, they have conversations. When they try to communicate science ideas or knowledge to the public, it's often best done in the form of a conversation. This book is therefore an invitation. On the one hand, it's an invitation to eavesdrop on some conversations about science. Like all dialogues, they're rambling, incomplete, and sometimes not fully informed. However, they may be interesting, and they may encourage you to delve a little deeper and find out more about something you got from an exchange. On the other hand, this book is an invitation to join in. Conversation about science shouldn't be left to the export, experts or to science enthusiasts. It's for everyone. There's no grade given for getting things wrong, for asking questions, for hazarding a guest, or a guess or for having an opinion. So while out there in the world, remember these conversations. Know that they are happening all around you and initiate and participate in some of your own. Maybe someone will eavesdrop, start his or her own conversation and keep the chain of engagement alive. So I'm gathering from that that he's intending this for the layman as well as the science enthusiast. And my own feeling as a total layman in terms of science. Um, I'm such a layman, people think I should have written Chew. Ha ha ha. Um, that uh, some some chapters I was fine with and some really went over my head. And I started to feel like I should be taking notes and then I realized, oh, I guess there isn't a test. So, <laughs> so I didn't take any notes, but uh, as far as the science stuff, but some of it was just like really difficult for me yeah me too and uh i began undergrad as a astrophysics major mm. um, i had a really good high school physics teacher that made me want to pursue that as a degree and that was why i went to the university i went to they have a really good astrophysics program and even i struggled with some of this stuff because it is uh, operating at a higher level than my one year of um, physics and calculus courses prepared me for back in the day. So mm -hmm. I hear you. So yeah, some of it, I'm, I'm not sure that he uh, made it simple enough for many of us, but now there were, there were parts that I thought were fine in that way. Um, the first couple chapters are pretty accessible. I thought those, so the first chapter, it's two people at a, like a costume party in a museum, and they're both yeah, wearing he could have set that up costumes. better. Hmm. It was a little confused. I was very confused right away of hmm. what context the because for a second I thought you know there's a guy dressed as a caveman, uh, <laughs> but it's drawn to look like he's part of an exhibit. <laughs> and then a spaceman walks up to him. And so I thought at first that maybe all of these dialogues were going to take place in some sort of hyperdimensional space where people from all times were interacting with each other. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That might have been but more interesting. <laughs> it, it was a costume party, and I was I just felt like I'd overinterpreted the artist's intention. Yeah, I think I might have briefly thought something along those lines myself. But yeah. Um, but anyway, it's these two people in superhero co costumes and they talk somewhat about like, you know, in thinking about science and what, and so on, what would, uh, real superheroes or real people with powers do in the real world? Would they fight crime or would they use those powers in other ways? And, you know, that's interesting to think about, um, and the second chapter, maybe the most accessible chapter, it's some kids who are trying to figure out why rice takes up more space after it's cooked. Yeah, I thought that one was really cute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so enjoyed that. Those were good, but then it gets into you know more kind of high level physics stuff, and um, some of it is just like I felt like he assumes somewhat too much knowledge on the part of the reader. Um, I, I was hoping for something a little bit more on my level. Yeah, some of the middle chapters I was really able to dig my teeth in to because they were touching on some stuff that I was familiar with but hadn't uh, thought about in a while or hadn't had explained to me 
in this media, but towards the end of the book, when he's talking about five dimensional black holes, I was admittedly also pretty lost. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there was one place where just as the conversation turns toward time machines and I start to get interested, then they, they have to stop. <laughs> the chapter ends and they stop their conversation. Yeah, because all of the chapters are predicated on these dialogues, but the dialogues are usually happening between strangers, mm -hmm. and they the setup is sometimes a little silly. It's a lot of times, you know, it'll be a person sitting on a train and another person sits across from them, and they're like, oh, what do you do? I'm a theoretical physicist. Well, I don't believe in God. Well, let's talk about it. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, so sometimes the setup was a little on the nose or a little too convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did make it seem like there are a probably larger percentage of just wandering physicists out in the world, <laughs> uh, ready to engage with people in dialogue. I have a friend who's a theoretical physicist actually. And, um, a joke that he tells is how do you know if you're talking to a social theoretical physicist and it's, they're looking at your shoes instead of their own. And so, <laughs> Um, I think it takes a special kind of person to want to engage with the uh, non-physicist or non-educated person about these sorts of topics. So um, if you're if you accept the premise that dialogues like this between two random strangers are possible, I think you do get some interesting uh, content for making that assumption. Now, I was one thing that kind of surprised me was in a number of places he mentions the multiverse, which. I thought was something that Marvel Comics made up. I didn't know that that was like a term that real scientists use. Do you know what that means exactly in in a scientific context? Uh, well, again, I'm not a I'm a failed physicist, but uh, <laughs> there's a couple different interpretations. There's one interpretation that uh, is more of a quantum interpretation, where it's that idea that every time you make a decision, a parallel universe where the other decision was made uh, also exists and occurs. Does that make sense? Okay. So every time you flip a coin, you're bifurcating the universe into two parallel universes, one where it lands heads, the other where it lands tails. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that was why in the chapter we talk about multiverses, he has that um, tree branch that he shows a couple of times above the two people talking. Mm. And that tree branch is supposed to look like the bifurcating quantum multiverse structure. Okay. But then there's... Uh, another type of multiverse theory that there are completely separate, unaccessible universes existing outside our own. Um, and so there are people who think about trying to look for ways, because the idea in science is science is limited by the universe itself. We can't measure anything outside the universe. The universe is defined as the space where everything exists. Mm -hmm. And so if you define science in that way, you have to try to then think of a way in which another universe interacting with our universe would create something that we can measure in this universe. Uh, some people think that's maybe what's going on with black holes. So some people, you know, a black hole sucks in matter. Uh, so there are an idea that maybe black holes are punching through our own universe into a new universe or into the universe next door to us, or maybe a black hole is the big bang for another universe. And we're existing inside of some larger black hole, big bang that occurred, you know, 13.8 billion years ago. So those are some of the ideas floating around. There's also the idea that we're living in a simulated universe, that this is not real, that we're in some alien computer, uh, sort of hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy style. And mm. there are actually scientists trying to think about ways to test that. So can we find the, you know, when you're staring at an image on a screen, if you stare close enough, you can see that it's made up of pixels and not actually the thing that it is the image of. And so there are essentially scientists who are trying to figure out if we can find the resolution scale of the universe and look at it and see if it's pixelated or if it's real. So mm. a lot of cool stuff going on. <laughs> okay. Um, a few other things that I thought were kind of strong and interesting and accessible. Um, I think it was in chapter three um, that they're talking about kind of how science is done. And I think that well, these t these conversations tend to be between a professional scientist and sort of a science enthusiast or an amateur scientist. Um, and in I think it was the, in that chapter that the the amateur scientist is sort of maybe misunderstanding how science is done and like, you know, each generation sort of replaces what was done before or, you know, throws it out and, and does 
better work. And the scientist is saying, no, it's more like each generation builds on what was figured out in the previous generation. Um, so that was interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the whole the famous Newton quote. Uh, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. Is yeah. that you know he he wouldn't have been able to figure out calculus if he hadn't had the all the previous work that had been done in mathematics to build on. Um, also, his rival in figuring out calculus was very short, and so he was also making fun of his rival. <laughs> <laughs> so, turns out Newton probably one of the smartest people who ever lived. Giant jerk. Not a not a. <laughs> Um, and also in chapter eight, um, he goes on with this metaphor of um, so solving scientific questions being like putting a puzzle together. I liked that. That was good. Yeah, yeah, that that was that was very understandable. Um, but I I wondered if maybe it felt to me like the problem was similar to um, somebody I used to work with, a, a boss I had back in the nineties who. Um, when we were struggling to figure out software manuals for various word processing programs and so forth, he would say, never let the programmers write the manual because <laughs> you know, they're too close to the subject. And I kind of felt like that might have been Johnson's problem here, that maybe he needed a collaborator who was more of a layman to kind of rein him in and keep him on a more of a layman's level. Yeah, I think, um, I think an editor, uh, for the script itself would have been helpful. Mm -hmm. And then I don't, I think the art was serviceable, but probably not ready for prime time. Yes. Um, and I think even just bringing in a professional inker, colorist and letterer could have helped. Uh, cause I don't think the art is necessarily bad. I just, uh, it it comes across a little bit like a one man show, where not you know, coloring and lettering are skills distinct from writing and drawing the comic, and so that's why those are different positions in the world of comics. And I think bringing in some of those talents, uh, a would have given it that second, third, or even fourth set of eyes that you were alluding to, but I think B would have made it a uh, just a smoother, more polished final product. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, he's he's fine at drawing inanimate objects and you know scenery and whatever, but his people are kind of the problem. Uh, they tend to be just kind of glassy-eyed uh, people with wide open eyes staring straight ahead. Um, he doesn't have much ability to really make the characters act. Um, he tries to pull off silent panels here and there and that just don't really work. It, um, you can't quite figure out what what the person is pausing for there. It, it, um, yeah, it yeah I, I thought about that a lot too because it, it took it took me a few instances of him doing that to understand that he was trying to create a silent beat where a character is thinking. Mm. Um, I think he used that trick a little too often and the way you read comics, you know, that silent beat actually lasts for less time than a panel with something you have to read on it. Mm -hmm. And so you as the reader are spending more time where the characters are talking and less time looking at the panel where the person is just thinking. And so it almost actually has the opposite effect because you tend to kind of skim over those panels. Mm. Um, I, I heard an interview with Scott, uh, Scott McLeod recently. So I've been thinking a lot about like, comics theory mm -hmm. uh, in a way that I haven't thought about in a while. I really want to go back and read Understanding Comics again. I think I would uh, get a lot out of it on a reread and it's been long enough since I've read it the first time. Oh, I've, yeah, I haven't I've read it in a long time. But man, just listening to, to him talk about it uh, in an audio interview, like it really reinforced uh, some stuff about how to actually tell stories with panels, I also saw recently uh, somebody posted on Twitter Jack Kirby's like different panel layouts depending on the number of panels per page, hmm. and they're so like structured but dynamic, and it's just you just you know you bask in the glory that is Kirby even when you're just looking at the way he would lay out a page <laughs> with no <laughs> art on it yet. Um, and I think you know we talk about this a lot with like 
music, I think Mozart is the, the person that often gets analogized with this, is that you have to know what the rules are before you can break them. Mm-hmm. And you have to be good enough to get away with breaking the rules, even, you know, especially if you're doing it consciously. And I think, you know, he even references, uh, or Johnson even references understanding comics. So he's clearly read the text and clearly is a fan of the medium. But I don't know that his skill level was necessarily up to the task of breaking some of the rules he tries to break when it comes to uh, sequential storytelling in this way. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Mm-hmm. I'm trying to be fair, because like he did, he did a good job. It's clearly a large undertaking. He put in a lot of effort, and it's more than I could do. Um, so I'm not trying to say that like I could do a better job of this, but if we're here to provide uh, critique and and analysis, I think, um, yeah, I think he pushes the bounds a little further than he his skill level was maybe ready for. Yeah. A um, few other things about the art. So um, I received this from MIT Press as a PDF file of almost 900 megabytes. That was a huge chunk. And um, so scrolling through it, if you, um, I had the problem where sometimes it would keep redrawing the screen. Um, mm-hmm. And it seemed like it must have been done in a vector program. Illustrator or something? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and I noticed that the line width in his art didn't vary very much. Um, sometimes the uh, lines think, seem a little yeah. too thin or too thick on various things. He could have benefited, I think, from changing that up in, in whatever he was using. Also, let's see. the Oh, the word balloon placement. Once in a while, I just could not figure out what order I was supposed to read the balloons in. Yeah, and he said that sometimes he did that on purpose, which, again, gets back to my point of, okay, it might have been your intention, but if you're, <laughs> if you're, the reader is feeling ground to a halt mm-hmm. because of that, yes. I still don't think, your, I don't think your intention wins out over the readability of the page. Right. I'm not going to say, huh, you could read it this way or you could read it this way. I'm going to say, which way am I supposed to read it? <laughs> and I also think like the ease of reading was um, made a little bit less smooth by the way that the people actually talk. Mm-hmm. So the book is all about dialogue, but most of the time the characters in these stories don't use things like contractions, which is a very common part of speech in English. I don't... Mm-hmm. Do contractions exist in other languages? I never really thought about it. Um, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> you speak Japanese, right? Yeah, yeah, there are contractions in Japanese. They don't use apostrophes, but there are contractions. So, you know, to have the dialogue... I, I get that maybe, like, you have one character who is more of the awkward physicist type, and maybe they speak in a way that is less naturalistic, but if they're supposed to be talking to somebody who's just an interested layperson, I don't know that the dialogue of those characters always worked uh you know that when you don't use contractions things just sound really robotic it's like you're watching a conversation between the vision and another robot that's also the vision i don't or, know or so, I, I thought of it as kind of like dragnet dialogue it just felt that that kind of rat-a-tat delivery um and there's so much of it also and it i just it didn't feel kind of relaxed and natural as it's supposed to in a lot of places it felt kind of uh, it's kind of driven all the time. Um, and then also, especially in chapter three, but maybe other places too, I felt like the scientist character would come off as kind of a smarty pants. Yeah, I got that a little bit too. Sometimes the, I think at one point I wrote down that one of the scientist characters and it was one of the male, you know, he does mix it up with the uh, gender and, and race, which was nice. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think it was one of the male scientist character does drop a well actually i was like oh come on i mean i i get that that's probably something they would say but it's at this point in our cultural conversation about how men and women speak to each other it was a little cringy so Mm -hmm. yeah well and then there would be a lot of times where somebody would ask a question and then the other person would sort of question their question or or you know blow it up in a whole different direction and just kind of again and again it felt kind of felt like Saying like no 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 you you idiot that's not the right question. <laughs> it was the kind of the Wait, feeling I got from it anyway. Yeah, and I mean, it is interesting that that's a big part of science. A big part of science is learning how to ask the right question. 
uh, and to get the right answer. I saw a really good demonstration of this uh, on Twitter the other day. A woman, who I believe, I think she might be a scientist or she's a science reporter. Or she she understands the, the world she's speaking to, said, uh, here's an important lesson in asking the right question. I said to my son, hey, should I put a banana in your lunch? And he said, yes, bananas are healthy and good for you. And so you should put a banana in my lunch. And then she said, ah, but will you eat it? And he said, no, bananas are gross. <laughs> so... <laughs> have to ask the right question yeah um and also sort of on the point of dialogue and also on sort of how much to assume of the audience's knowledge um there was a a point that i found particularly frustrating where they're talking about the higgs boson and the the less professional scientist character starts to say the go and the other person keeps saying no no don't use that silly name and it doesn't articulate what the silly name is and i had to go googling what they were talking about it was it was the god particle and like oh yeah, yeah. i guess i've heard that but i you know in the in the book i didn't know what they were talking about and i would have rather that they just you know said this is a silly name and we don't like it but you know say what it is i I, it was just kind of frustrating. Yeah, I could see that if you if you didn't know what they were referring to. I guess I've I've got a few uh, just sort of science things here. Um, I think I had one nitpick, hmm. and it was at one point one of the characters. I don't remember. I took this note a while ago because I've been reading this book for a little while. Um, well, one thing I will say, I did like that he used coloring to, uh, coloring the word balloon so you know which character was talking when they were off panel. That was mm -hmm. kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I actually hadn't, don't think I'd seen that in a comic before. And I was like, no, oh, that's, that's clever. Uh, and then he says something about left-handed, uh, being left-handed being convenient. It might be one of the characters who's drawing a diagram. And being left-handed is not convenient <laughs> as a left-handed person, I will tell you. <laughs> the world is built for right-handed people. Sure. My wife's sticking her tongue out of me right now to demonstrate that she doesn't care about my plight. <laughs> um, I guess the, these last few things in my notes are just complaining about things that I didn't understand. <laughs> um, so the, it's, I wrote the explanation of how to read the equation for how electric and magnetic fields are related to each other is incomprehensible to me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even as a working scientist, you know, I have to deal with some equations in my uh, line of work and the research that I do. But even I struggle with an equation and, you know, it really is its own language. And if you can't see those symbols for the words or the ideas they represent, it, it's very difficult to actually conceptualize what is being talked about. Uh, when I used to teach statistics, I was teaching, you know, introductory level statistics. I was teaching basic probabilistic statistics, things like how to calculate the average of a group of numbers or the standard deviation or stuff like that. And one of the tricks I would make students do, because they too would get bogged down in equations, is I would have them actually, like if we presented a problem in the form of an equation, I would have them rewrite okay, now what is this equation saying in plain English? You can't use any of the symbols in the equation in rewriting it. And you make them do that enough times, and then they start to just intuitively translate the equation in their mind into English that they already know. And that seemed to do a good job breaking down the barrier between the terror of seeing an equation and understanding what the equation means. But it does take that level of concerted effort and practice to get comfortable doing that. And so if you're just reading a book for fun, I don't know how well that translates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, this book, I mean, I, I did men as I mentioned, there were some parts that I found accessible and interesting, but a lot of it just felt like it's hard to read for fun. I'm just reading it to talk about it on the podcast um, or trying to read it. But yeah, some parts I just got really bogged down in. Uh, did you have anything else about this you wanted to bring up? I actually did enjoy large chunks of this. I don't think it was bad. I just, uh, one of the things you said we should talk about is, like, who's the audience for this book? And that's sort of an open question for me still, even yeah. having finished it. Um, yeah, I think his intended audience is not always going to get into, you know, like I, the parts that I struggled with, I think, because I feel like I'm I'm part of his intended audience, but um, right, you're an educated person. Yeah, who likes comics. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so, that's, that's interesting. I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to feel about that aspect of it because I will say, as a scientist, that it can be frustrating that you can only write for the public at a certain level. And I get that that's just what it is. And every profession mm -hmm. of sufficient complexity has to deal with this problem. You're always feeling like you have to dumb things down, but for things, yeah. It, so every once in a while you do just kind of want to say, you know what, screw it. I'm going to talk to you at a level that I think you can handle. And if you get that wrong, then you just end up leaving everyone in the dust. Mm -hmm. Um, when I give talks, you know, I have to think a lot about, okay, who's the audience for this talk? Uh, so if I'm giving a talk at a vertebrate paleontology conference, I don't have to explain the concept that ground sloths and tree sloths are related. But if I'm giving a talk at a very general science conference, you know, there might be other scientists in the room, so educated people with doctorates and degrees and, and you know, professorships who don't know that. It's not that they're dumb. They just haven't been taught that because it's not relevant to whatever field of science they study. And so I think a lot about, like, what information do I need to present up front to make sure that nobody is left behind when I get to my cool result within that context. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, be, I'll write talks that are 50% introduction. I spend 50% of my time just making sure that everyone in the audience is there with me when I get to the gee whiz aha moment. Because otherwise, you know, once you've lost a person, it's very hard to get them back. I think from my experience, you're much less likely to lose someone who gets a little bored because they've heard this before than you are to lose somebody who can't keep up because they've never heard it before. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think maybe uh, Johnson went a little too far in the diving into the deep end and didn't give enough runway to the people who needed a little bit more space to stay caught up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you said, yeah. An, an editor, I don't know. I don't remember what kind of editor credit there was in this, but I think there wasn't, there... I mean, it's really, the, the book is just credited to Johnson. Like it looks like this was a completely um, done on his own project. I, I was also thinking like, if this had been done as a web comic where he could have just gotten feedback, you know, posting page, you know, mm -hmm. post a page, it's feedback, which is how the Martian was written. Mm -hmm. um, and in early drafts of the Martian, I think probably read more like this than the final novel that got published and adapted into the movie. Uh, we actually had Andy Ware on my podcast and he talked about how like the main changes that he made based on the feedback from posting early versions of the Martian online was just differentiating the characters more working on the dialogue so that people actually sounded like different people, you know, things that this graphic novel struggled with a little bit too. And so I think that, especially if you're not a person who's used to writing fiction, uh, that's hard. And it's a skill that clearly develops over time uh, with practice, just like he was talking about how practice of looking at equations helps you understand what they are. And so, you know, if you grant that premise about equations then I think you also need to grant it about the art you're trying to produce and maybe open yourself up to a little bit more feedback along the way to make sure you do a good job of, of making something that works for as most, as many people as possible. Now I'm looking at the, the pref the acknowledgements section. He does mention, see, Alice oven was the first commissioning editor who really listened and got it when I found her and explained what I was trying to do. And this book may not have made it to print without her enthusiastically championing it well at IC Press. Um, now, and it doesn't necessarily mean that she actually edited it. I'm not, not quite qu clear what happened there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you'd, if, if, if you have to dig around in the acknowledgments for it, it's probably not somebody who really went over the book carefully. But anyway, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting idea and... Uh, Parts of it are uh, accessible to anyone, but other other parts are uh, kind of too difficult. Welcome to science. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that makes science sound horrible. Yeah. And and again, a, 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 the art is is a bit of an issue. Also, it would have been I think a little easier to engage with with a little bit better uh, better drawn uh, characters. Yeah, which was, you know, that's unfortunate. You, you want, at least I want something like this to succeed on as many levels as possible. And so I have to acknowledge that there there are definitely some failings in uh, the composition and the storytelling and, and the scripting and the lettering. And um, 
none of them are deal breakers, but they all add up to being a, a less than completely successful product. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to be really fair because right. yeah. I couldn't do something this good, but I'm also not trying to right now. So <laughs> I'm just trying to talk about the, the, the one that I read. So, yeah, I mean, there are good points and bad points to it. Like, like most everything. Um, so it could have been better, but it could have been worse. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, partially successful. I could put it that way. Do you have a favorite comic that talks about science? Hmm. Um. I don't know. M- maybe Razzle, which we've talked about already, but uh, well, that, but that's that was... science fiction. Okay. Um. Hmm. I can't think of one right off. Can you? Yeah, I, th- I can think of a couple. One of one I'm having trouble remembering the name of right now. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, so there's one on... It's more of, of a history book as much as it is a science book. It's called Bone Sharps, Cowboys, and Thunder Lizards. By It's written by Jim Ottaviani and drawn by uh, Xander... Or is it drawn by Xander Cannon or his him and his brother... Uh, hmm. No, I think, yeah, just Sander Cannon. Um, and Jim Ottaviani is actually a guy who's written a number of science-based graphic novels. So he wrote one about Richard Feynman, and I think he wrote one about um, various women in the field of primatology, so like the Jane Goodall types. But Bone Sharps, Cowboys, and Thunder Lizards uh, covers a fantastic period in the history of paleontology here in the United States uh, about a great feud between two paleontologists so vicious that it became known as the Bone Wars. Ooh. Okay, sounds good. And then um, there's also a comic that just came out called, oh, what's it called? Dinosaur Empire Life Before Us. And that's a really good one for kids. I think Bone Sharps and Thunder Lizards, it's not adult in any way, but it's the story of two men deranged by you know their uh, obsession with fossils. Whereas Dinosaur Empire is strict, like it's definitely an all ages kids book. It's very pedagogical in teaching about different uh dinosaurs throughout the Mesozoic era. So that's uh, written and drawn by Abby Howard. Okay. And that was really good. And then um, there's one more about, there's one more that, there's one more that explains evolution that I thought did a really good job. And it's called evolution, the story of life on earth. And that's by Jay Hosler. Also illustrated by Xander Cannon with help from Kevin Cannon. And so that's a really good, that one is, that one has a fun framing device because it's an alien school child learning about how life evolved on this weird planet called Earth. <laughs> so that one's kind of fun. Oh, by the way, um, well, actually, not long after the last time you were on the show, I was in Minneapolis and interviewed Xander Cannon. Um, and he shares a studio with Kevin Cannon, but they're actually not related they're not related. Yeah, no. they just happen to have the same last name. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So, so those are three uh, graphic novels that I think uh, are really good at explaining science using comics. Not that this one's bad, but I think these are three particularly exemplary examples. Mm-hmm. And uh, because they're relying on professional artists instead of writer-artist combinations, the art on those three really shines, too, in a way that is is pretty delightful. So, mm-hmm, cool. Dinosaur Empire has some really... Fa- Dinosaur Empire just came out last year, so it has some really fantastic and up-to-date dinosaur reconstructions. If, uh, if you want to really hammer home the feathery dinosaur approach to things, that's, that's a good one. Mm, cool. Okay. Oh, and one other thing I want to mention for people that are interested in learning more about physics in addition to this book is my friend Ben, uh, the theoretical physicist I mentioned earlier in the show. Ben Tibbet does the podcast, the Titanium Physicist Podcast, where Tim may be a little bit more accessible to you because what they do is they bring on a person who is not a scientist and they have a dialogue. So he has a number of physicists with him and then one guest and they try to explain a concept to the guest. I see. Mm, Okay. And so that way the guest... You know, it's a very naturalistic, it's more naturalistic dialogue because the guest does actually get to ask the questions that they have in the moment. And the physicists are encouraged to make ridiculous analogies about things, which happens in this book as well. (laughs) And um, it's just it's a fun show. And at the end, if the physicists succeed in explaining the concept to a person that they all get a piece of fruit from Ben. So (laughs) (laughs) it's a a good time. Titanium physicists, you can get it on iTunes and all the other pod places around the Internet. Hmm. 
The okay. end. All right, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to listen to that. Ryan Haupt hosts the podcast Science Sort Of and sometimes appears on the iFanboy podcast. Coming up, Clifford V. Johnson, the author of The Dialogues, talks about the 18-year journey from idea to finished product, looking for a publisher that knew both comics and science, what not to say when pitching your project, and more. First, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon and make that your bookmark for future purchases. We'll then get a percentage of what you spend. It costs you nothing extra and helps us cover web hosting and the other costs of presenting this show every week. We really appreciate your support. This is an imaginary podcast, which may never have happened. The Short Box Showcase. But then again may have. About a father and daughter. I'm Professor Allen. And I'm Emily. Who came from Ohio and talked about comics. Walking Dead. Tintin. Black Lightning. White Tiger. It tells of their rise to glory, when the great guests were yet to be booked. Let's put it this way, Shogun Warriors wasn't going to win any Eisners. And the great feats of editing not yet performed. And this is Ultra 7, this is Ultraman Jack, and this is Ultraman Taro, and this is Ultraman Leo, and this is Ultra... Of how they spoke at length. This continuity is really the brainchild of nitpicking nerds the world over. But to be fair, the best kind of confession is the Force Confession. And reviewed in brief tales that explore creatively the bounds of a given character's history. Red Sun is wonderful with a very strange ending. Of brilliant creators before their fall from grace. This is the era where Miller is at the height of his creative and artistic powers, and the ability of strong writing to encapsulate and transcend its time. Flash of Two Earths by Gardner Fox. This is an imaginary podcast. Aren't they all? Shortbox Showcase is part of the Relatively Geeky family of podcasts. Check us out on the web at relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com or search in iTunes for Relatively Geeky or Shortbox Showcase. And remember, we're not experts. We're just family. Okay, uh, now I am on Skype with the author of the dialogues, uh, Clifford Johnson. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing very well. Uh, great to talk to you. Yeah, well, it turns out that you're already a Deconstructing Comics listener, so... <laughs> It's yeah, nice it's, to it's great to actually uh, sort of hear this voice that I, I'm, I'm, you know, quite familiar with from listening to several episodes. Um, uh, but actually, sort of seeing you on Skype as well, so yeah, of, Whoa, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, now it appears that you are actually in kind of a science lab type place. Where are you exactly? Uh, this is my office, which um, is, it's actually, uh, it used to be a lab many years ago. I'm actually a theorist uh, in terms of the kind of physics I do. I, I mostly, uh, you know, my, my, my work uh, uh, is, is, you know, pushing lots of equations around pieces of paper and drawing weird things on blackboards. I don't um, do actual experiments. Um, so this is... This is a, an old lab um, that is is um, sort of a by today's standards, it's an ill-equipped small lab for a modern experimenter, and so it was kind of at least temporarily um, not really useful for for someone doing experiments. It would need a huge amount of money to be spent on refurbishments and what mm -hmm. have you. Its heyday was in the 60s, mm -hmm. so it ended up being kind of a storeroom. And I was looking for a new office, and they said, "Well, we have this room." And I said, I'll look at it. And it turned out to be, you know, three times the size of a regular office. And that was around <laughs> the time when I was looking for something that could double as an office um, as well as, if you like, uh, an art studio, because I was coming up to sort of the final year of production on the, on the, on the book. Mm -hmm. And so this worked out perfectly. So you, you might be able to see um, uh, my drawing table. Yeah, it looks like you got a bunch of comic pages on a bulletin board there in the background. <laughs> Yeah, as I was um, as I was finishing pages, I uh, I was you know I was doing things like just checking how it how it really looked when it was all together, or I was looking at sort of uh, color choices, and so I would I would throw them up onto the board, or as I was planning out big arcs, I would have some of my rough pages um, laid out so I could really step back. It's it's a sort of a I don't know like a five by 
five, five by four um, corkboard, which is great to put pages up and just sort of step back and see how the thing was looking. And it's a way of just reminding me that, you know, there's an actual thing that's being created here and uh, it's not just on a hard drive. It's actually <laughs> going to be a physical thing. So, I, you know, I have a, a not so great little color printer that was at least giving me a sense of how some of the finished things looked. And now you're at, uh, what was it, USC? Yeah, University of Southern California in L.A. Okay. Now, where are you from originally? I'm picking up a little bit of British <laughs> accent in your pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm originally from England. I, I lived around a lot, but I'm originally from England. That's correct. Okay. Uh, busted. A lot, a, a lot of American <laughs> pronunciation has uh, ta- kind of taken over, but occasionally it kind of comes out. <laughs> yeah, it depends on who I'm talking to and context, things like that. I, I, right now, I'm, I, I've been in... Uh, three, uh, actually this is my fourth sort of meeting end on end uh, today, some of them quite long. Mm. And I, I, you know, and to make yourself understood, you tend to sort of drift your accent to, to sort of calibrate with whoever you're talking to. So, mm. so I think today I've been all over the place. So I will sound more English uh, uh, in other meetings or, or now that you've reminded me that I'm English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suddenly it's, it's kind of come to the fore here. Right, I'll start going, what ho! <laughs> no, we, we don't do that. <laughs> so now I understand, or I, I kind of gathered from the intro to the book that you've always been interested in both uh, comics and science. So tell me something about that, like your interest growing up. Well, um, yeah, I was, I, I, was, I was fortunate in a way um, to, and, and some of your readers may appreciate, uh, readers, listeners may appreciate this, uh, I, I, was, I was from a time when um, comics were uh, hard to come by if you weren't in, you know, uh, a major metropolitan area or something. Um, it, not just the time, but, you know, there, basically there wasn't the web. You could just basically, you, you, where you can now just sort of grab uh, whatever you want. Um, back then it was, uh, uh, there, you know, a few copies would come to town, but also I was for... From age four until 14, I was actually in the Caribbean, which is where my parents are from. So I was on this tiny little Caribbean island called Montserrat. Um, there'd be one or two stores in town that would have a little one of those little spinner stands mm-hmm. uh, with, with, with comics on. And if you were lucky, you managed to get to it before you know some other kid in town got to it to get that next issue of daredevil or whatever and um and then uh uh, and then of course there were other kids who who you trade with and what have you but it was very interesting um both comics and science were kind of fed by similar things and that was in some ways the rarity of the thing you're interested in because on the science side i was also learning a lot of stuff experimenting a lot i had this paradise island you know i didn't appreciate that at the time at this paradise island that i was growing up with but um uh i was beginning to dream about being able to build and make things and explore things that were simply not available on the island you know i essentially used up the library as it were mm. and then was mm. kind of dreaming about this land beyond that i would be able to if i could only get these things i could build this there was a little radio shack i would go there and buy components with my pocket money and build things but there was definitely this thirst to, to learn more, to explore more, which in a way keeps you really interested in the subject. And uh, and I think also with comics, there's definitely this element of, um, oh no, I have this big gap in the story between you know this issue and this issue, and you're using your imagination a lot to fill in those gaps, and you're using a lot of ingenuity to figure out whether anyone else on the island has a copy of that issue. <laughs> <laughs> Tracking uh, the down the next part of the story, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was an it was an interesting time. A lot of it done in sort of isolation from the rest of the larger uh, culture, which which again I think was was actually very character building. Um, mm. Okay. So now, what was your uh, well? Tell, well, I want to find out more about the process of uh, making uh, the dialogues and getting it published. Uh, what was your motivation for making this book, and and why as a comic? Yeah, well, that's an interesting uh, story in that the core idea for this book uh, is, 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 uh, is about 18 years old. Um, and it began from, so even back then, um, it seems so long ago now, but uh, 
in the scheme of things. It isn't. Um, uh, I, I've had a long career in in in, in physics, doing um, you know doing research, doing the professor gig, as it were. But also very very uh, for me, uh, I think it's hugely important to to put something back, uh, which is to say, it's a real privilege to be able to sit around and think about how the universe works and the kind of things I do, uh, sort of, if you like, blue sky research. And, you know, we, we have a society that's set up in such a way that it makes that possible. And, and I think it's important not to forget that. Uh, and I think one of the ways I can, I, can, I can put something back is to explain and get people excited about science, help people engage with science more broadly. So I've always done that kind of thing. You know, I blog about science. Um, uh, uh, do a lot of public lectures and things like that. Um, and uh, so people who do that kind of stuff a lot write, usually end up writing a book of some kind. Mm -hmm. And usually it's a prose book and it's, you know, it's the expert telling you, you know, here's what's going on in this field and it's very exciting and here's a book. And, and it's words. And that's great. And those books are awesome. Um, my feeling has always been that we're not reaching as many people as we can with those kinds of books because not everyone likes to learn um, uh, about science that way. There are many other ways of learning. And in my field especially, I just didn't think there were as many um, other ways of doing that. So I didn't feel any urgency to write that other kind of book, but I hadn't really figured out you know, what it was going to be. But the thing that occurred to me 18 years ago was that there was nothing that celebrates conversation about science. Mm which is huge, right? We all talk about science, uh, or, or, or if we don't, we all should talk about science as much as you know any other part of our culture, because I really think that science is just part of the tapestry of culture that we should all partake in. So I thought it'd be fun to um, make something that uh, celebrates the conversation about science, invites people into a conversation about science by, by kind of eavesdropping on it, and, and then also maybe encourages them to have their own conversations. So that was the core idea. But at the time, it was still kind of a prose book. Um, uh, but then I thought it'd be fun to maybe see a little bit of what happens in those conversations. You might scribble some doodles, as you do on a napkin while you're having a conversation. And so, so, so it was going to be sort of illustrated every now and again with one of those. But then... I, I, you know, I forgot about it and worked on other things, did more research. Every time I came back to the book, I realized that that visual component was much more important to me. Mm. I thought it would be fun to see who these people are who are having the conversation. That might help draw you in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it kind of great to see where these people are. What kind of environments are they in? They're not in labs or what have you. They're actually, they're actually um, uh, out there in the world. And then, and then it really struck me sort of in the mid-2000s that, oh, this 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 visual component is way bigger than just being the occasional illustration, and then I realized, wait a minute, this is a comic book. This is narrative art. I should be using to tell this story. So it, it took a long time to get there, but then once I once it hit me what I was doing, then I, it sort of blew my mind because then there was I, you know I looked around and there really wasn't much out there that was similar. There's a lot of sort of science comics, lecture comics, adventure comics with science embedded in them. But not really a, a sort of non-fiction science book for you know a grown-up or, or whatever that that is is tonally similar to uh, uh, the kinds of science book non-fiction science books that are out there, but in, in in graphic novel form, which is a really powerful form for telling narratives. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, so I thought I, I would just make it because it needs to be made. Okay, now you're you're the artist on this also, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How how did you draw it? Was it, looked, it seemed to be maybe done in a computer. Um, it, it's they're actually a, a mixture of styles, um, uh, depending upon the story and the time uh, which I was doing it. Because I, you know, I started drawing on it seriously in 2010, um, partly just because I wanted to answer the question: uh, Can I actually do this myself? Should I should I should I collaborate with an artist or should I do it myself? And I thought the way to do it is to is to just to do it. And then if it turned out that it wasn't working, I would go, OK, I'll, I'll call in the professionals. Um, uh, and maybe I should have. Who knows? But <laughs> but the core thing there was to start experimenting with 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 uh, going from being, you know, a basic uh, sort of sketcher slash doodler, as you know, a lot of people are to really raising the, the level of competence to in order to 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 do a you know 250 page book so i needed to to you know learn 
lots of different um, drawing styles. I needed to learn speed, consistency, all those things that you never bother about if you're just doing an occasional sketch. So I basically just started drawing all the time and practicing, practicing, because the only way to learn how to draw is by drawing and just by drawing again and again and again. And, and, then, and then learning uh, things that work for you, styles that work for you, and so on and so forth. And then I was really studying graphic novels seriously now, going back to old comics, looking at new comics, and really learning what goes into making those things. Um, and, uh, and then learning a lot of the old fashioned traditional techniques that people don't use as well. So, so I have, I, I ended up getting really interested in it. I have lots of old books about drawing from you know the, the the old sort of advertising days when when that was that was the main illustration drawing the classic books from 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 way back in the early part of the 20th century that I, that I ended up learning a lot from even though a lot of the production techniques are not relevant anymore mm. and all of that's in the book you will see you'll see some stories that are really traditional i i roughed i penciled i scan those pencils, I print them out, I ink on them with real inks, with brushes and pens. I scan that back in and all of that. And then there are some that are I drew entirely digitally. Um, uh, and then there's some that are hybrids of that. Um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the last six months when I was running really low on time because I had a deadline, I, I needed to sort of really find ways of of streamlining my workflow to go from, you know, what in 2010 was one page every couple of weeks to more than a page a day mm. um, by, by by late by late 2016, mm. and uh, mm. things like the iPad uh, and and the and the Apple Pencil, which is an extraordinary device that not enough people are talking about, mm. that helps speed things up a lot. Um, uh, not just for digital stuff, but for hybrid stuff as well. So scan stuff I could bring in and do half tone on the subway because I'm running low on time. Uh, 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 by you know stuff that I could take away from my desktop uh, um, and and still do high quality work on um, on the iPad. That was crucial. So so you'll see as you flip through the book, pretty much every every production style you can imagine uh, uh, represented in there. I'm not familiar with Apple Pencil. What is that? Oh my goodness! Um, uh, of all the devices Apple has produced in the last many years, um, it gets the least attention, and I think it is the single most revolutionary. It's a it's a it's it's a pencil they made. It works on the iPad Pro. It's you know a special screen. The screen has to be a little different in order to work for it. For, on it, and you know, you'll be familiar with different styluses that that people, third parties, make for for, for iPads, and they kind of work. But and, they, and you know, some of them are good, and some of them are terrible. Um, uh, Apple finally decided to give in. Uh, there's a long history there, and make their own stylus. Well, yeah, I and, know Steve Jobs didn't like style. exactly, and you know, he was gone. So someone said, "Let's do this," and it was great. They just blew everything out of the water. Um, from an artist perspective, uh, and I speak as a, you know, as a hack, not, you know, just a, just a, just a, you know, an amateur artist as it were, but uh, I, I think you'll find real, real artists will say this too. It is revolutionary because the, you finally, first, for, finally for a, a, a stylus on the iPad, you have something that feels like you're actually drawing with a pencil. Mm -hmm. You have the sensitivity. Um, there are there are you know things you can do at, at at sort of very shallow angles with the side of a pencil when you're drawing, which you normally can't do. Um, only you know on a on a Wacom professional uh, thing would you be able to do that. You can achieve with an Apple pencil, and then and then uh, uh, so it meant that I just had this additional uh, e expressive range of stuff I could do away from my desktop. So. When I was trying to get up to a page a day in those latter stages, I needed to be basically working every waking hour on finishing this thing. So being able to do a bunch of work in this room, and then I'm heading home for a few hours of sleep before I come back in early in the morning. Um, uh, on that way home, I could jump on the subway and still be 
working on some 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 finish work using the Apple Pencil on the iPad and things like that. It was a crazy period there that last time because I set myself this deadline. I agreed it with my publisher, and I really wanted to stick with it because I needed to get back. I was on a sabbatical year, so I needed to spend one semester finishing the book and then the next semester doing research, and I couldn't leak. I couldn't let the deadline slip into the research thing, into mm. the research one. So I had a real solid deadline I had to stick to. Okay. Um, now, uh, how did you end up, or how did you go about finding a publisher? You ended up with what, MIT Press. MIT Press. That is an interesting story as well. They, so the biggest lesson I've learned, um, it, it's a little facetious, but that, there's, a, there's more than a grain of truth. Never go into a publisher and say the following words. Um, I'm really excited. I have a really original idea. <laughs> Nothing out there like it, and uh, it's gonna it's gonna break new ground. Apparently, publishers are not interested in any of those things. <laughs> they probably hear it from everybody. <laughs> well, the point is, is that um, no one knew what to do with this. Everyone was excited, bless them, uh, about uh, publishing something from me. You know, I'm a sort of reasonably well-known academic with, with a platform. Publishers look to see what platform you have. Um, you know, I have a public profile, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so basically most of the responses are from, you know, the big six in New York and all their imprints, I guess it's the big five now, is, or at least all the ones that I was allowed to talk to, um, uh, you know, through, through uh, you know, uh, agents or whatever, uh, was um, the response was, we're really excited about a regular science book from you, a re regular science book from you, but this thing we don't know what to do with. Mm. Well, we're excited about it. It's a really great idea, but we don't want to touch it because they're, they're too risk averse. Mm. And so it was really, really frustrating. So, and then, you know, the people, the imprints that do sort of serious science books where, would go, this is great, we love the subject matter, but we want to see a prose book. <laughs> we don't really understand what all these pictures are. And then when I tried then, uh, then I walked away from the whole thing and then I spent some time sending it uh, unagented to just, just winging a prayer to graphic novel imprints and occasionally got some some you know, some uh, some contacts that allowed me to even speak to some some creative senior editors at, at some well-known comic publishers. And their thought then was, this is great, but what's all this science? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was sort of between a rock and a hard place, between the devil and the deep blue sea. And it was first, it took me a year of doing this. I, I, I took out, I stopped production for a year, 2012, just trying to figure this part out. And uh, it was very frustrating because the, the message really was, um, this is too innovative. Uh, we see what you're trying to do, but we don't want to touch this because we don't, we don't trust your opinion that there's a real market for this. Mm. So that's really frustrating to hear. And I, I was going around saying, look, I do a lot of TV stuff for science, uh, both in front of and behind the camera. I know there's an audience of people who say they love science, um, but they prefer a visual way in. We could tap into that audience. Um, I, I guess they just didn't believe what I was saying. Mm. And so, uh, so that took a long time uh, to, to get to, to, to work through all of that. In fact, um, I was amused just, just uh, about five months ago, I got one of the rejection letters from, that I had for a, a, a package I had sent out in 2012. Finally, <laughs> said, yes, very nice. Thank you very much for this is not for us. So I thought that was really cool. Um, but, um, but back to the, the story then, then I began to think about, well, what other kind of outlets um, might, might be interested in this? Because I was determined to not just try and do what they wanted to publish. I was saying, this is the thing that I, I really think could uh, be you know, important, if, if, uh, if it doesn't sound too self-important, an important new way of getting people excited about science. I, I want to show this is possible. So I wanted to stick with it. And then I ended up... Um, then looking at small uh, imprints, um, I also tried stuff in the UK because I know there's, there's you know, there's kind of a different approach to um, uh, the culture of graphic graphic books depending upon what country you're in. So I thought I'd also try some small publishers. The problem with small publishers then, um, very small publishers doing very creative stuff is that they're, they're risk averse for very understandable reason, reasons. They might just, they might put all their effort in, a, in like a three person operation to produce maybe three or four books a year. Mm. So doing something that's an unproven match of genre and subject or form and subject 
is is clearly not something they would want to do. So I got a very a lot of very polite, excited sometimes emails, sort of saying, "I see what you're doing here, but we just can't we just can't try this." Uh, and then finally, uh, and then I spent a lot of time looking at the whole self-publishing market. I learned a lot about self-publishing, very interesting. And I almost went that way if it were not for the fact that I was very wedded to producing a full color book. And the, the, the analysis, when you go into it and you look at the numbers, um, it's, it's still not quite feasible to try and do a full color, high quality book. Um, uh, uh, self-publishing and, and have the cover price be at all feasible. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so I sort of backed off from that. And then I thought, oh, academic publishers, that could be interesting. So I spoke to, I, I, you know, I've, I've done an academic book before. So I spoke to those publishers. They completely didn't get it. It was very, very sweet kind of comments they got back. I don't think the, the editor who looked at it had ever read a graphic novel. So that was kind of funny. <laughs> Um, Where's Spider-Man? Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, so then I sent again, just unagented, because at this point, um, uh, I, I just wanted to have a real conversation with a real person, as opposed to through uh, through agents who I find incredibly frustrating and wish they never existed. No disrespect to any <laughs> agents. Um, um, uh, but uh, I so all of this is now unagented uh, since, since that first initial attempt at uh, uh, going through a standard sort of science book agent that someone had connected me to. I, I politely said, I'm, I'm done. This is really frustrating because I'm not having a real conversation uh, with someone about what I'm trying to do. I'm having it through you and with respect. It's not really the kind of thing you handle. So, so, so all of this was just me sending things out. Um, so I thought academic publishers. Uh, would be a good match because they might be more interesting in interested in uh, doing something a little a little risky if I could find the right person. Most of them said no because again I think they're going. This is not what we do. Um, very few academic publishers do anything like uh, uh, graphic novels or, or comics or anything. A lot of them publish about comics, but that's a, that's a different thing mm. from actually in comics. A lot of them are not set up to even uh, know how to deal with with handling a comic. Um, but then I actually found this, just as I was giving up, there was this, this, this new um, editor at uh, a little press uh, for Imperial College in, in London um, who, who uh, heard about what I was doing. And she had just done a course on comics publishing in her publishing sort of what have you. She'd come to this thing, uh, to this publisher, and was super excited about trying new things. And most of them were just saying, you know, Please just do what we do, what we're doing. And, uh, but then this project came along and she really championed it at Imperial College Press. So I actually was got under contract with them for a while. But then she left because mm. she's actually an awesome editor and at an early stage in her career at the time. And so, of course, she got to moved on to greater and, 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 and better things at a place that doesn't do physics and stuff like that. Yeah. But then MIT Press um, uh, started thinking about expanding their their physics book offerings. And someone heard that I had this book, um, uh, that I was doing this book project. And so they, they got in touch and, uh, and then we started talking. And, I, I, and then I, I basically said, look, I'm happy. I can probably transfer it from Imperial College Press and uh, here's what I'm trying to do. And, and they were pretty much on board with that. They, they had never done anything like this before. And so there were some production hiccups and there remained some, you know, some hiccups. But their hearts in the right place. I, I think they really saw what I was trying to do and and and, and went with me on it. Mm, okay. But yeah, it took a long time. <laughs> so um, I was wondering. Well, we didn't. We couldn't find. Well, Ryan and I, when we uh, recorded the review of it, we weren't uh -huh. able to find any like editor credit. I mean, what kind of uh, feedback did you get from other people who were reading it? Um, and were these people who knew comics or like what what kind? Who did you talk to about it? Who, sh who read it before it was published? Actually, no one. <laughs> okay. uh, 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 I, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's very interesting because I have a lot of friends in the film, uh, film and, and theater and television industry. And uh, I watch how they work and, uh, and I admire their ability to create things and then constantly share uh, with people to get notes and things like that at every stage and, and build wonderful things. And, and I, I couldn't do that with this. It's partly, 
partly because maybe I'm a little too um, uh, uh, focus on this one thing I tried to do that I was trying to do with this that hadn't really been done before. And so the frustration I had when I tried, when I told people what I was doing, just generally, is that they kept telling me, oh, uh, this is, you know, they kept telling me what they thought the thing should be. And they kept wanting it to be like things that were already out there. Mm. And so in some ways that was polluting the originality of what I was trying to do. So at some point, very early on, I stopped telling people what I was doing. I just told people I'm working on this project and one day I'll show it to you. And, and, and I just showed it to no one. So, so when, when it, so I, I, I showed samples, um, to, 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 to editors when I was trying to, to sell it to a publisher. Um, uh, but, but I wasn't looking for feedback in terms of, you know, at once I was producing it for a publisher, I was, and, and, you know, I think that was one of the freedoms I got by working with a, with a small publisher who hadn't done this before. They didn't have a view on this. They, they, they trusted that the science would be right because mm. I'm a reasonably known, uh, uh scientist. Um, they, and they, but they, they, they stayed, you know, no one was sort of coming in there and saying, oh, you should, you should design the characters this way, or, you know, this, this, this should be this way or the other in terms of the arc of any particular story. And, and, uh, I wasn't looking for that and, and, uh, and happily I didn't get it because I probably would not have been very receptive to it because I was just tired of people telling me that either this won't work, a bunch of stories, people sitting around talking, to sci talking about science won't work, or you've got to have an adventure, it's got to be a biography. You know, one of the things I learned about a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the comics that intersect with science um, uh, that publishers out there, um, and I won't name names because I spoke to some of them and I don't want to make it sound like I'm being unkind, a lot of them think they're doing science and they're not really, they're doing biographies. Mm. Uh, and, and so a lot of feedback I got was, if this were a biography of a famous scientist, we'll go with it. Uh, and, and, and so there are lots of great things out there that are biographies. And incidentally, there are some science that comes out because you're learning about that person's science. But it's mostly about this, this you know, famous genius or this quirky character or what have you. And that was not what I was trying to do. For me, the science is the starring character. And you're hearing it in the mouths of lots of characters who are fictional but it's still nonfiction science that's starring. And I, I, there's just nothing out there like that. So, so MIT Press and form, formerly uh, Imperial College Press were very happy to sort of step back and let me go with that concept and just do what I wanted. So, in, so, so I'm not thanking any editors because there were no editors to thank. Um, uh, there, was a, there was a disastrous, and again, I, I should be, uh, they meant well. Uh, uh, there was a disastrous period in the summer um, of last year, which which delayed the book a lot because uh, there was a misunderstanding. Uh, that, you know, th th there's a copy editor who checks that you know you spelled things correctly, and uh, I have lots of notes at the end of every chapter mm. that give you uh, lots of copious further reading, which I think is one of the highlights of the book uh, in terms of how useful it can be. Um, so there's a there's a there's a there's a, the Chicago Manual of Style um, uh, that that certain publishers adhere to when it comes to how you how you do citations and stuff. So they had a copy editor checking that and I was very happy with that. So 11 chapters, two pages uh, uh, each chapter that do that. So she was supposed to be looking at 22 of those pages and checking that I got my commas in the right way in the quotes and that was great. It turned out she started going in and trying to uh, comment on the text in my speech bubbles as well. And that was a mistake. Mm. Um, because what it meant, it held everything up partly because she doesn't understand, she didn't understand conventions of comics. So she was complaining about things that don't fit the Chicago manual of style, <laughs> or she was making suggestions that ended up making all the, would have ended up making all the characters sound like they were perfectly copy edited people in a conversation, which, you know, yeah. isn't a real conversation anymore. <laughs> so I had to push back on that. But every round of pushing back took several weeks because she's probably working on several other things and she would give me a round of things and mm. I'd go, I'll take these co comments on the 22 pages of citations, but I'm rejecting each of these. Oh, she did catch some things that were helpful in the, mm. in the, on, the, on the picture pages, but mostly it was misunderstanding, misunderstanding, thank you very much, no, thank you very much, no. 
but then that would be around used up. Uh, so three weeks later, she'd come back and repeat some of them. And, what, and so I was going insane because there were a number of key things that I was trying to get the book to hit in the fall that we ended up missing because we were held up on this ridiculous copy editor who doesn't understand comics trying to, mm. trying to, trying to fix. Um, we, we had several rounds where we were just talking about double quotation marks. <laughs> <laughs> Someone wow. goes, hey, right? Double, 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 you know, not yeah. double quotation yeah, uh, double uh, exclamation point to really emphasize standard thing in comics. Yeah. She was going, this doesn't, the Chicago Manual of Style says that blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, this is not. <laughs> so in the end, I kept saying, look, just treat them as though they are pictures, which in a way they are, and, 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 and ignore them. Uh, and then finally, I had to appeal to someone higher up. To her credit, she wasn't, she didn't know she wasn't supposed to be doing that. So mm. it was one of these things, that was one of the things of working with a publisher that doesn't do this kind of thing. I had to teach them uh, uh, some, of the, some of the conventions. So it's kind of an interesting adventure. Uh, and I have twice as many gray hairs as, <laughs> as when I started out as a result. But they, everyone uh, in the organization means well, even if collectively sometimes there were some hiccups. One thing I found a little, well, kind of tantalizing reading the book was that in one of the chapters... Yeah. They just start talking about time machines, and then, oh, got to go. <laughs> you just started get talking about time machines. Come on, tell us more. <laughs> got to leave something for volume two, right? <laughs> no, seriously, um, there was, um, uh, in the original, um, when I finally laid out all the different stories that I had as possibilities, um, I actually had about enough material um, sketched out, partly in my head and partly in, in um, uh, you know, on the page, um, uh, enough material for about uh, 350 to 400 pages. Yeah. And, I, 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 uh, and so it, it, including that was one, 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 st one conversation which was about time travel and how you would actually go about building a time machine if only certain things in, 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 in science could work out, this is how in principle you could build that. And, and, the, and there's actually a fun scenario you could do uh, with, with that. Um, but I just had to, at some point, I had to make some choices. And so there's a lot of stuff that's hinted at. Um, one of the beauties, I hope, of the reading process for, that, for the book is that you get, t you get tantalized by some of this and then you go to the notes and you'll see there's, there's, there's further reading. Um, uh, uh, that you can you can sort of any topic um, uh, that there's enough further reading reading that uh, you can uh, you can s slake that thirst that I may have uh, uh, created. Are you planning to do another book like this? I would love to. Um, uh, I would have to sit and think when I would do it and and how I would do it. Um, in terms of you know, it's very time consuming. It, it, I don't do it as a full time job. Um, uh, I, you know, I have the professor gig, I, I, you know, and, and so on family uh, duties and what have you. So I do it in my spare time. Um, I, I was lucky enough to be able to devote um, a, a sabbatical semester to, to, to the finished work on this book and combined it with the summer that came before. So that was a nice combination. But, you know, in terms of how long it took me to, to work on this thing in my spare time, it was since, it was since 2010. So, so I would not want to be taking as long to produce a, a second volume. But I think I'm, I'm faster now. I was learning the drawing techniques and the production techniques as I was doing it. Um, like I said, I went from, a, you know, a page, a page a, a week or more to a page a day at some point. So I can do it um, uh, faster. Um, there are certain things that I tried and experimented with that uh, I'm really pleased with in the book that I would love to revisit. And that's really when I'm when the, 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 the subject matter being discussed and explored on the page is working on three or more levels at the same time, uh, by which I mean the following. Uh, you've got the people talking about the science. You know, the, you've got the words in their mouth, two people in this conversation. Maybe uh, I'm also using on the same page uh, panels that just sort of, you know, are themselves talking about, sort of, sort of showing some of the stuff they're talking about, maybe an analogy or what have you. You may also have the people, so that's another level. There's another level where maybe the people are doing something physical. You know, there's a page where someone's talking about, 
uh, how space and time might break down in certain ways. And they're pouring a glass of water because there's an analogy with fluidity there. So there's so that's a third thing that's going on. But then the other thing I was able to do as well, because because physics and comics, in my opinion, have this the synergy that hasn't been explored before, is you can also play with the structure of the medium itself to illustrate some of the physics ideas. Because, because, because when you read a comic, you actually create space and time, you the reader. You know, there's a convention for, here's a panel, here's another panel, here's another panel. You, 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 you infer the, 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 uh, either the, the expanse of space that these panels are showing you or the, or the passage of time. So if I'm talking about the nature of space and time, like in time travel or aspects of quantum physics or aspects of uh, physics in a black hole or both, I can also mess with the conventions of panel structure in order to convey some of those ideas. And I do it a little bit in the book in a way that either is either overtly there or covertly there. I would love to play with the, some of that stuff more. I, th I think there are physics ideas that are in contemporary research right now that are hugely exciting that you could really unpack on the page in a way that's never been done before. So, so that's a long way of saying, yes, I would love to do this again. I'm just not sure uh, when, I, when, I would, uh, when I would try it. Uh, um, but I would probably try and um, you know, use the workflow that I've learned to do it way quicker than, than, uh, than, than I have uh, before. Mm -hmm. Now, um, are you still much of a comics reader? Is any, any, uh, what's interested in what you might, might have read lately comics-wise? Oh gosh, um, I, uh, I occasionally um, I, I'm not really necessarily reading a huge amount of uh, co contemporary superhero stuff. For example, I am sometimes required to dig back in because I do a lot of science advising for uh, some some of the Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I go back and remind myself some of the source material that that either they know about or I can let them know about in terms of maybe some of the scientific aspects. So so for example, I was the other day just reading some of the old. Uh, classic uh, uh, first appearances of Black Panther um, uh, uh, because I was writing some stuff about the, the, the Black Panther movie. Um, I got the opportunity today actually to, to uh, I was in a meeting with, with, the, with, the, with the writer um, uh, um, uh, and telling him he just did a great job on you know the science which is very upfront in Black Panther and stuff mm. like that. So, so, um, so, but, but in terms of what I read uh, when, I'm, when I'm choosing to um, it's 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 usually graphic novels that are not necessarily in the superhero genre. Although I do look in from time to time on the superhero stuff. So that would be, for example, my one of my favorites from last year was um, was uh, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking. Um, uh, Sunny Lou's masterpiece. Um, you know the the the, the pretend. Um, mm, oh yeah. Um, the biographical work of the I, the, the work of Char Charlie Chalk High. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, see, I've got it right over here. Yeah, right Char there. Charlie Chan Hock Chai. Yeah, we, we talked about it on the show last year. My so, so I mixed my syllabi up there. Yeah, uh, not syllabi. Um, syllables. Syllables. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a long day. Marvel. That is a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for, uh, you know, in terms of how what comics can do in terms of bringing narrative to subjects. You know, this this is history. Um, uh, it's, it is also, a, you know, an adventure story that it's also biographical, but, you know, fake biographical as it were, but it's also, you know, watching him use all those different styles. It's a celebration of comic styles. That, that is amazing. I, I um, uh, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's a great example. I just, um, just picked up, um, uh, my favorite thing is monsters, um, which I'm looking forward to reading. Um, I'm, uh, other notable ones of recent note, I guess this is a while, this is maybe 10 years old now, David Masticelli's Asterius Polyp remains mm -hmm. in, my, in a, modern, a modern masterpiece. I, I, I particularly they're interested uh, because, of course, I know David Masticelli in his 1980s incarnation mm -hmm. in, in, in his amazing work in a completely different style. Uh, with Frank Miller on on uh, on Daredevil: Born Again, or or with Frank Miller on 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 uh, Batman Year One, and he was already a master there, and now he reinvents himself completely mm -hmm. um, in in uh, in a serious polyp in completely different styles, playing with color and line in ways that 
very few people have been that adventurous, uh, at least, you know, uh, in recent times, uh, in, in, in a major public work, published mm. work. So that's been super exciting. Mm. Um, so those are examples. There are many more, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, uh blanking right now. <laughs> um, but, uh, those, those are my, Oh, I'm a huge fan of, um, of, of, of anything involving either of the Tamaki sisters. Um, uh. Uh, sorry, cousins. Um, cousins, yeah. Uh, Jillian uh, Mar- and uh, what's the other? One? Uh, uh, Mariko and Jillian. Mariko, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, ju- just uh, I do a little bit of a style change. I shouldn't probably shouldn't say this. I do a little bit of a style change in one part of the comics where I'm, where I'm uh, just for fun. Uh, I'm, I'm actually having uh, some children in, in conversation, and I deliberately simplify the style. Um, and make it a little more cartoony. And, and in order to learn how to do that, I actually looked at, at this one summer uh, a little bit to, okay. to sort of uh, reproduce some of her drawing. You know, I don't come anywhere close to the mastery of line and, and the character that she does, but that was at least something, uh, a place where I sort of uh, at least helped me move from one style to another uh, uh, to, by studying her, her work. Mm-hmm. All right, well, thanks a lot for your time today. Uh, yeah, this was good. It's a real pleasure. Uh, I hope you. I hope you enjoy uh, reading it. I hope your 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 listeners uh, enjoy engaging with it. And uh, if anyone's interested in, in more process, you, if you go to my blog, what you can which you can find uh, uh, by googling me, just you know, Clifford Johnson blog in Google. It's called Asymptosha, but no one can ever spell that. So it's, <laughs> Google it. Um, you'll see if you go back over the years since 2010, you'll find lots of posts there uh, showing process. Um, and, and then. Uh, uh, um, if you if you look in various categories like sketches and drawings and things like that, you'll find a lot of uh, uh, sometimes terrible things I was experimenting with, and then sometimes more slightly accomplished things later on. So, what should we conclude from all this? The dialogues is an interesting and ambitious idea for a way to bring science to the general public. I think the flaws in it that Ryan and I discussed and certainly the lack of an editor who could have helped Clifford to increase the accessibility of the book, are symptoms of the fact that comics, and especially comics creation, are still a very niche thing. There's no comics literacy at most publishing houses that would be inclined to publish a book on science. Clifford mentioned Asterius Polyp, and the mainstream media reviews of that project also suffered from a lack of comics literacy. On the other hand, science literacy is also a kind of niche, and it's hard to think of a comics publisher that would have been talked into publishing this book either. Too much science! No matter what you think of the execution of this book, the story of its publication, and also of its flaws, tells us that, at least in the U.S., both comics and science are poorly understood by the general public and there's not much overlap between the comics fans and the scientists. But it takes trailblazing projects like this to highlight such issues and hopefully bring about change. Tell us what you think. Write us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com or contact us through social media. Find all the links on the right sidebar at deconstructingcomics.com. We're also on the Comics Podcast Network at comicspodcasts.com and on Comic-Con.com, where our new episodes appear a few days before they show up anywhere else. Also, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio, or wherever you find podcasts. We really need more listeners to give us reviews and help us stand out from the many comics podcasts that are out there. Our theme is from bensound.com. Once again, don't forget to help support the show with a pledge at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Next Monday on Critiquing Comics, Mulele and I finish our look at this year's Pitch Anthology page from Irrational Comics, in which five writers are each given a chance to have eight pages of their comic illustrated and put on the web for readers to vote on. In this episode, we'll discuss an offbeat superhero comic and a post-apocalyptic story of how the Earth would change without humans on its surface. How well did the writers utilize the eight pages they had to draw in readers? And in two weeks, at last, after years of it languishing on the to-do list, P. 
Peter Bagg's hate finally gets the Deconstructing Comics treatment, Tom Spurgeon joins Kumar and me to review this 90s classic. Till next week, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. <laughs>